Hi everyone, welcome to TMS Talk Season One, Episode Six, and thanks Jen for giving me this opportunity. I'm the opening co-host of today's talk, and my name is Bing Bing Ying, and a PhD student from McGill University. And currently, I'm doing my exchange at the University of Toronto. And today's seminar will include three parts. In the in the first part, I will have a brief introduction of our society as today. I saw many new friends join us, and then our co-host Dr. Xiao Li will introduce today's speaker, Dr. Jing Xin Li, and Jing Xin will share his exciting research with us. And this talk will last 30 to 40 minutes. And after talk, we will have a 30 minutes Q&A session, and our co-host Chong He Wang will lead the Q&A session. So okay, now my turn to have a brief introduction of our society. The first question is, what we are? The Mudlet Society, or TMS for short, is a nonprofit organization that aims to build a community for young scholars to freely and equally build connections, share this work, and exchange thoughts. The second question is, what activities we have currently? So now we have three activities, including TMS talk, TM, uh, WBA talk and the TMS workshop. The TMS talk focuses on sharing scientific research and opportunities for science, and the w, uh, WBA talk focuses on the experience and opportunities beyond academia. The TMS workshop aims to help you build your skill set that will be used in academia and beyond. So please subscribe our WeChat and the Twitter channels as you can see in the right side, the QR code, and then visit our website for more information. And if you want to be the next speaker, please email us today. So, okay, now I will pass the webinar podium to Dr. Xiao Li. Hi, Li. Hi, Xiao. Hi, Xiao. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Xiao Li. I'm currently a postdoc at Stanford University. It is my great pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Jin Xing Li. Jinxing is also a postdoc at Stanford. He earned his PhD degree from UC San Diego. He worked with Professor Joseph Wang, and his research focused on microrobots and nanorobots for drug delivery and biodefense. And at Stanford, he is working with Professor Jianan Bao. They are developing soft and adaptive bioelectronics. And Jinxing is a recipient of a number of awards and fellowships such as the CBEL Scholar of Bioengineering, ACSDIC Young Investigator Award, Dan David Prize Scholarship. And in particular, in 2019, he was selected by MIT Technology Review as one of the invest, uh, innovators under 35 years old. Today, Jinxin will talk about both his PhD and postdoc work under the title Adaptive Biodesign for Medical Electronics and Microrobots. Jinxin, now the stage is yours. Thanks. Let me share the screen. Uh, okay, I assume you guys can see the screen, right? Yep. Good. Yeah. So uh, thanks, Xiao, for the introduction, and I thank everyone for uh, inviting and also coming to my talk. Um, today, I'm very glad to share some of the work I've done at Stanford and also at uh, UC San Diego on developing electronics and robots, uh, which are very adaptive to the biological environment for medical applications. So I'll begin with showing a photo three days ago I took at the Stanford campus in my lab. The title to the photo is about uh, 11. Uh, I think it's a similar time on the East Coast right now. So this is how was the Stanford campus was look like, looking like. When I look at this photo, I think it highlights uh, a few healthcare crises uh, which we are facing. First, we are dealing with this uh, infectious disease, COVID-19. And also we are dealing with the climate change associated with air pollution. And also because of the quarantine, I think many people how to stay in at home meaning that we have very limited health care access. And the long-term quarantine also caused a lot of mental disorder and stress to everybody. And these are also lifestyle-related health issues 
I think I'm not the only one who gained a lot of weight during the COVID. So I think this is the crisis we are, we are facing right now. But our mankind is kind of very adaptive. It's the most adaptive species on this planet, I believe. So in fighting COVID, for example, uh, even though we don't have good effective treatment or vaccine right now, but at least for the testing uh, actually become more scalable and available to everyone. So about two weeks ago, I went, uh, I did my, <coughs> excuse me, I did my first uh, COVID test. It took just only two minutes. I, I think it's like much quicker than get a coffee in Starbucks. But what we see here is that actually uh, the healthcare, the testing is not inside the hospital, but rather outside the hospital. I think this pointing out a very important change that the future healthcare infrastructure, they should be shifted outside from the hospital to everybody's home, to your car, and to your, on your body. So by doing so, we're not just making the like, uh, treatment or diagnostics uh, closer to your body, but more importantly, <clears throat> by doing so, we can diagnose early uh, so that we can prevent the disease. We can also manage the disease more effectively because we can provide precision intervention. So what is the problem, what's the challenge? When we look at the, I'm not talking about the challenge in biological medicine side, I'm talking about the challenge in engineering side. I think historic, uh, historically speaking, the challenge is that uh, the engineering systems uh, were built to improve our productivity. So I think that our human beings care more productivity uh, than life before. Uh, if you think about these computers, um, machines, uh, robots, actually they are all used to improve our productivity rather than for healthcare. And we were even better than killing people uh, rather than saving people because uh, a lot of these advanced technology they are used firstly in the military. And this is something I think uh, are going to change in the coming decade. So if you look at the current like state of the art, wearable implantable device, uh, there's a big challenge is that the information we can collect and the intervention we can provide actually are extremely limited. For example, if you look at the wearable device, uh, they can mainly capture the physical activity and the vital signs. And this very uh, bioelectronic neuromodulation device, they're very uh, invasive and they can only treat certain severe conditions. So we need, so this is a challenge we are facing uh, because when we make conventional electronics robots, we didn't consider how complicated their human physiology uh, is. So I think when we develop next generation medical electronics robots, we have to take this into consideration, meaning that we have to deal with the different mechanics, chemistry, as well as electricity in our biological system. So my previous research have been uh, trying to solve this challenge uh, from the perspective that we are trying to develop materials to build robots and electronics that mimic our biologic materials so that we can make them seamless interface and precisely interact with the living system. So specifically, this includes using skin and a tissue inspiration to develop soft electronics for either hormone sensing, neurotransmitter sensing, or neuromodulation as well as muscle-inspired soft robotics with adaptive transformation. And my PhD was focusing on uh, using bacteria or cells uh, as a, our inspiration to build a micro-robot for medicine delivery. So today I will show you two uh, examples of this. So uh, the mechanical mismatch between soft biologic tissue and the conventional electronic materials lies in the fact that their modulus mismatch in a few orders. So this huge mechanical mismatch caused multiple problems. So one most important problem is that our organ tissue body is always moving and soft. So this will cause dislocation and inflammation at the device tissue interface, which will lead both the device and the treatment failure. So in the past uh, a few years, uh, there are a lot of people are working on this field, trying to make soft electronics, to make them stretchable, so that they are very compliant to the biological tissue. So there are two uh, important approach to solve this issue. Uh, one is led by uh, Professor Dion Rogers, uh, who currently at Northwestern. So he's using nylon fabrication to 
process the conventional written materials into this wavy or micro nanostructure to enable stretchability. So in our lab at Stanford, uh, we are focusing on developing polymer-based materials which are intrinsically soft for like uh, bio bioconformability. So here, uh, the problem I want to talk about is that uh, chronically, our life is not stretchable but a one-time stretch. So think about from children uh, to from infants to children to adults. Actually, our body, our tissue, our organ is undergoing very large and irreversible volume expansion. Of course, until you, you really work out to lose weight, uh, otherwise you, your body organ is always growing larger and larger. So this uh, gives us challenges when we think about the children, they're not little adults, meaning that if we develop medical devices for them, we need, we need to consider that for them, the health does not just mean the absence of illness, does not just mean they don't have any disease, but also means they should have a healthy and a sustainable environment to develop and grow. But the problem is the current uh, bioelectronic device, uh, they are not designed for pediatric population. So they are usually made by a rigid size and shape. So this will pose strong uh, compression to their uh, nerve tissue. Here's a case study, uh, it's a little bit bloody, I, I will show you. This is a, a patient who is 12 years old, uh, who was implanted with vagus nerve stimulate, uh, stimulator. And after two years growth, actually you can see that this calf electrode holds strong compression to this vagus nerve. And this, this area, uh, you can see this is much larger. So this caused a lot of side effect, including difficulty in respiration. So the neurosurgeon has to use a very painful and complicated surgery to replace this calf electrode. And some of the patients even need to go through multiple replacement surgery. So I think this uh, is very horrible and ridiculous. So then we should think about uh, how can we develop electronics that can adapt to a slowly growing biological environment? How can we make electronics adapt to tissue growth? So this problem cannot be solved by stretchable electronics because it cannot accommodate the tissue growth without posing any strain. So the solution is that you might see something like this or something like this in your life. This is a very uh, interesting uh, mechanical property called viscoplastic deformation. So when these atoms bonds are broken by external force, the atoms can form new bonds in new location rather than try to go back. So this is the property we need to make adaptive electronics. So here is the design. Uh, we made this electronics device called Morphe. Uh, that has two materials inside. The first one, the substrate and the encapsulation layer, is made by a modified PDMS. I know a lot of people use PDMS as a rubber uh, elastic. But here we add this IU dynamic bonding in this uh, PDMS network uh, to dissipate the energy, so to enable the viscoplasty. In the meanwhile, this bonding also enables the health self healing uh, capacity of these materials. So the conductor part uh, is made by uh, mixing the glycerol with the P.PSS, which is a conductive polymer. So we then use laser fabrication method to write this uh, conductor part and then stack all these layers together to make this Morphe electrode, contains a resistive strain sensor, a stimulation electrode, and a recording electrode. So here's the device uh, we made. So here we see that when we straight, uh, stretch to 100%, it shows um, Risk plastic and irreversible deformation. So when I took this, this picture, I didn't realize late, uh, the editor likes it and I highlighted as the cover of this, uh, this month's Nature Biotech. So we test the stretchability and we see that uh, the conductor part actually is still work conductive when it's stretched to 150%. And what is interesting is the mechanical property. Here we see that when we stretch the device, which is this blue curve here. As we can see that this device poses zero strain. So meaning that uh, this device is be be having like flowing fluid when we stretch it very slow. But when we stretch it very fast, actually becoming more solid. So this is also very important because it can prevent the device from unintended deformation when we implant it in the, in the body. 
So I think what this is device for adapting tissue growth by implanting the underside nerve of a rapidly growing rat, which grow from about 100 grams to 300 grams in eight weeks. So in the uh, animal study, uh, we also ordered the commercially available calf electrode for comparison. So the first thing we realized that for the calf electrode is that during the surgical process, actually it's very complicated for us to slide this soft nerve uh, into this calf electrode. And now we can see that right after the implantation, uh, actually it caused deformation of the nerve. And we need to know the exact size of the nerve before the implantation. But for our morphe, because we have this um, self-healing capacity, uh, we can just uh, slide underneath, wrap it around, and see it. We just press for two minutes. Uh, as you can see from this video, it forms a very um, robust and a durable interface. So in chronic study, uh, we see that the strain sensor can precisely measure the neural diameter, which grows from uh, one millimeter to about 2.5 millimeter in, uh, in about eight weeks. And uh, we also observed that our morphe was able to evoke compound action potential, meaning that it can provide effective neural stimulation uh, from week zero to week eight. So what we are doing is that we are stimulating the sciatic nerve and we are recording the action potential on the palm of the rat. But we see that the control, the cough electrode were not able to induce uh, stimulation after week two. And another important feature of our device is that because we are using a conductive polymer for stimulation, which has both the electron and the ionic conductivity. So we have much lower impedance, meaning that we can use a much lower voltage to uh, stimulate the neuron. So we also did chronic uh, a behavior study and we checked the uh, leg movement as of, of the rat. Here we can see that the rat leg implanted with morphe, all the toes are open. Uh, and the, the pore function is very normal. And the rat leg implanted with calf electrode, actually all the toes are, uh, are clumped together and the pore function is abnormal. So this is the indication of a sciatic nerve damage, as we can see from this video. This is the calf electrode. And this is morphe. So uh, we also did a lot of uh, like sensory motor function tests to validate the compare like the leg implanted uh, with morphe and the leg implanted with calf electrode. I think uh, uh, basically what we observed that there's pretty much no damage for the leg implanted with the morphe because it can uh, grow together with the, with the nerve. And we, what, we, we check what's, what, what happened after eight weeks. Here we, is what we see. So after eight weeks implantation, uh, we can see that this morphe is still form a very uh, conformal interface with the, with the sciatic nerve. Uh, but for the cough electrode, uh, as we can see, this is a cough, the post strong compression to this area. Actually, the majority of the nerve already grow outside from the cough. Uh, even we tried really hard to suture it inside, but the nerve still grow outside uh, in, in many of these animals. So this is why uh, we are not able to provide effective neuromodulation. And also in the inflammation study, we also see that a lot of this neural fiber we crushed by this uh, cough electrode, even it's made by rubber. So I think all of this result how true is that we have developed morphine electronics that can grow and morph with tissue. And also it allows a customized surgical process without knowing the actual size of the nerve before implantation. And we can provide chronic sensing and neural stimulation in growing organ. And uh, so we, we think that this will have a very big translational impact uh, for future pediatric uh, neural stimulation device. So now I'm going to uh, switch topic to robotic device. So just, just like, uh, I'm not sure this video is here anyway. So just like uh, Bill Gates early dreams that there will be like computers in everybody's home, I think uh, in the future, definitely there will be robots in everybody's home. And uh, uh, definitely they can take a lot of jobs, including scientists. So this video shows uh, a robot I like pretty much. I'm not sure why the, <clears throat> okay, it's working. So robot can replace me to do experiments. So when I was doing my PhD, I showed this video to my advisor, Joe Wang, he asked him to buy such a robot so I can graduate. So, so then he responded, looking at me and say, 
and said, Jinxin, I think you're still cheaper. So I think that's the, the future trend. I think uh, our uh, robots are eventually they're going to beat the low pr price of PCI postdoc and enter our lab. So one challenge when we are becoming closer to robot is that the safety. So uh, one trend in the field is that people are trying to develop robots that can sort of soft and adapt to the environment. So here, one example I made at Stanford is that I uh, developed this polymer robot. Uh, the dimension here is about one centimeter, which can be programmable and can uh, do a lot of tasks. So single body because they're made by soft body, so that we're adaptive and they will not induce any damage to the environment, to human or themselves. So this is a bigger advantage. But here I, will, I would like to focus on another dimension, which is the micro nanoscale, uh, because it, Making micro nano robots is, I, I believe, it's one of the most exciting uh, challenges in science and engineering. Because if we were, we were able to do this, uh, we can in directly interact with a single cell or on a smaller scale so that we can change the way how we treat disease. So, what is the fundamental challenge to make a micro nano robot? And what is the challenge for nanoscale locomotion? Uh, the challenge is that there is no uh, inertial uh, nanoscale when the size of an object is scaling down. So if we take a look at the Navier Stokes equation, and uh, if we ignore the inertial part, the consequence for that is that uh, the motion is pretty much dominated by the viscosity of the surrounding environment. So in this case, uh, it's pretty much our human beings swimming, or the swimming in a pool of honey rather than a pool of water. So in this case, uh, it's very difficult for you to swim. But in nature, we see there are a lot of uh, microorganisms cells, for example, sperm cells, they're using a flexible flagella to generate a propulsive wave uh, to, to, so that it can produce a forward motion. And another uh, uh, micro, I think this video is not working as well. Another uh, mode is using the uh, helical flagella that are the rotated the body. In this case, they are basically like a corkscrew going through the wall so that they can uh, go through this uh, very low Reynolds number environment. So in the past decade, I think a lot of pioneer work have been done in the field. Um, for example, Brad Nelson, uh, Pierre Fisher, as well as uh, Martin CT, uh, they did a lot of pioneering work on making nanostructures that mimic this uh, natural bacteria or cell uh, to generate effective uh, locomotion. So when I was in San Diego, I, I have been focusing on using a method called a template assisted nanofabrication to make these nano swimmers. So one thing, uh, one, one way we, we make these uh, helical nanostructures is that we did this plating copper co-plating this nanopore. And when we uh, etch this copper, we got this plating helical nanostructure. And then we deposit our iron or nuclei on this uh, nano helical structure then it can respond to magnetic field, as we can see. It can generate very effective forward motion. So using this similar uh, template deposition method, uh, we also invented a, a few other nano swimmers, including flexible nano swimmers, by making this uh, magnetic element in the body, as we can see here, where it can be actuated by our oscillating magnetic field, which is pretty much mimic the sperm cell motion. And another thing is that uh, we realize if we have this two magnetic element on the both side of this nano swimmer uh, as the two arms, using, uh, using oscillating magnetic field, actually we can achieve a freestyle uh, nano, nano Phillips uh, motion. I think this is the most powerful magnetic actuation in terms of body lengths per second, uh, because um, by tuning the frequency, it can produce a synchronized uh, oscillation of, of this, uh, of this uh, nanorobotic body. And it's also powerful enough to capture trans and transport a single cell, as we can see, uh, which is much larger than the robot itself. So what can this uh, nano device do for us? So think about if there's, uh, if there's particles in the fluid environment, if there's no actuation, basically there's browning ocean going on. And if there's, if there's actuation but no control, actually we can get an enhanced random work. So this can accelerate a lot of process. And if we can control the motion, then definitely we can use it as a nano manipulation tool. So here are a few engineering applications uh, held down. The first thing is that we can control this nano object to either moving mask or moving lens. 
to, con uh, to control the light exposure on this photoresist surface so that we can translate the trajectory of these nanoswimmers into a surface pattern. And the second thing is that if we have a small micro lens, um, and which can be actually controlled, actually we can use it as an imaging tool. So here's the video I show you. Uh, it's a logo made by E-beam lithography, uh, which cannot be seen by optical microscope. But if we control this robotic micro lens on the surface, actually it can help us to amplify the feature on the nanoscale. After this video, I made it for fun and I never published this. And the third thing, actually, these nano swimmers can be used as sensors. So here, these nano swimmers, uh, they can respond to hydrogen, uh, which is a chemical fuel for the propulsion. And what we can see from here is that this droplet contains these this nano swimmers. And we will put a droplet of hydrogen here. So after a few seconds, this hydrogen can diffuse to this droplet and trigger the motion of this nano swimmer. So in this case, uh, we are making a sensor that can see, sense in the hydrogen leaking, uh, which is a fuel for the rocket. And this also, I think, example of why, why social distancing is very important. As you can see, uh, just in a few seconds, these chemicals can travel very fast in the environment and trigger some chemical reaction. But as I mentioned, the ultimate goal, of course, is to use this uh, micro nano robot to treat disease, to have medical applications. So in that sense, when we talk about this uh, with our collaborator, uh, Professor Liang Fang Zhang, so he suggests that uh, ideally this micro nano robot should, be, should have self-proportion, meaning that if we are using it for drug deliveries, he would not expect the patient to take the pill and then he has to push some button to trigger the actuation. So in that sense, uh, we, are, we, we, are, we put a lot of focus on the self-proportion micro machines. Uh, actually, this, uh, this, this area is piloted by Wise side uh, from Howard. I think his original paper was not on the micro nanoscale, but on a cent um, centimeter scale. He made this PDMS boat with a platinum on this rear. So when we put this uh, boat on peroxide fuel, uh, the platinum serve as a catalyst to decompose the uh, peroxide to generate bubbles. Actually, in, in his early work, he did not uh, show any video uh, in the publication, but in my PhD, I replicate this experiment, as we can see, uh, this is a petri dish with peroxide in the petri dish. And this is a micro fish. I uh, use screen printing method made, as we can see, when we put in peroxide, uh, it starts to swim very efficiently by producing oxygen bubbles. So about 2004, uh, Sen and Malog group at Penn State University they have switched this proportion mode into nanoscale by making this gold platinum nanowire, which can also swim in the peroxide. And later, uh, uh, Oliver Schmidt group and Yung, Yung Feng Mei, uh, who was my master advisor, um, he, they invented a micro rocket uh, by rolling up the same film with platinum inside. So when this micro rocket is placed in the hydrogen peroxide, as we can see, it pretty much uh, can more efficiently, and, and if we uh, coat this micro rocket with a nickel layer or iron layer, actually, we can remotely steer the proportion of this micro rockets. So then we start to think about how can we translate this uh, into biomedical use. Actually, a lot of work are done by uh, my previous colleague, Wei Gao. Uh, he did a lot of work on developing uh, micro motors using zinc and magnesium so, so that we can get rid of the peroxide fuel because they can react with. Uh, either acid or even water to generate bubbles for effective proportion. And of course, uh, zinc and magnesium have widely been used in uh, bio-resortable, biodegradable electronics. For example, um, Professor Jung Rogers did a lot of work in this field. So since we have this micromotors uh, ready, and we also have the pure biologic fuel gas uh, GI tract fluid inside our body, so we start to think about how can we translate this into biomedical use. Um, before I talking about that, I, I want to uh, uh, mention a few facts. If we want to deliver a um, drug delivery method for GI tract delivery. So the whole GI tract is about 30 feet long. And the typical GI transition time in our body is about 30 hours. 30 hours actually is pretty short in clinic settings because a lot of disease treatment, they need like weeks or months long-term therapy. So the problem is that um, 
the patients, they do not usually uh, follow the instruction from the doctors. So they do not take the drug. So this is one of, one of the major reasons uh, for a lot of chronic disease treatment failure. So in the pharmaceutical company, what they are doing is that they are really trying to improve the drug retention in the body so that they can improve their efficacy. So the goal is that we, would, we want to have longer and safer gastric re residence. And another thing about our GI tract is that there are like hundreds of bacterial species that colonize in different segments of the GI tract. Actually, most of these bacteria are beneficial to our health, um, even though some of them are hostile. So when we develop medicine to treat GI tract disease, ideally we should precisely target the, the specific area without killing the uh, good bacteria. And also GI tract, the physiological environment is very complicated. The pH range from one, extremely acidic, like in our stomach, and to the intestine actually is very neutral. So these are a few facts um, we, we have to keep in mind when, when, when we think about our design. So, a few years ago, uh, we did our first uh, testing of this synthetic motors in live animals' body by using this zinc micromotors, and we testing in the mice stomach. As we can see, this uh, zinc rocket can move very efficiently gastric acid. And the experiment we did is that we want to check the retention of, of micromotors in the stomach. So here we compare uh, how much this particle is in the left. And we did a comparing experiments by using this zinc micromotors with the platinum micromotors, which is very stable and cannot react with gastric fluid. We found that uh, with effective proportion, a lot of this zinc micro rocket, uh, they stayed in the stomach more. And uh, we also use the gold nanoparticles as a model cargo. We use ICP to test their biodistribution on, the, on this TI track. We see that with this effective proportion, we have more gold particles stayed in the uh, stomach. This means that uh, these micromotors might effectively uh, re improve the retention of this uh, cargo payload in the GI tract. So then we start to think about uh, how can we use it to de deliver drug to treat disease. And then another problem jumped out is that uh, if we use drug to treat disease, then many of these GI, drug, drug, uh, GI tract disease, uh, we take antibodies which are usually made by protein. So uh, if, we, if we want to take these drugs to treat, the, to treat the GI tract disease, you need to neutralize the gastric fluid first. So there is a drug called a proton pump inhibitor. Uh, usually people take this drug half an hour before you take the real drug. Uh, this drug is to neutralize the gastric environment so that the real drug will not be damaged by this environment. So we think that uh, this problem can be easily solved by using micro motors because our micro motors actually is a, is a device that can directly react with the acidic environment, uh, the gastric acid. So here we use this zinc micro motor. Uh, we show that by using only five grams, these micro motors actually can neutralize the mouse gastric fluid in about only uh, 20 minutes without affecting the normal stomach function. So combine this, all of this uh, knowledge, then we did our first uh, live animal study to treat the disease. Here, the disease model, what we use is our H. pylori bacterial infection. And we use these micromotors to load the antibiotics called chloromycin to, uh, to treat this bacterial infection in the stomach. So uh, here is the design, and I'll show how does it work. So these micromotors, they're loaded with antibiotics on their polymer coating. And when they enter the stomach, the magnetic interact with the gastric fluid to neutralize the gastric fluid so that the drug will not be damaged. In the meanwhile, this actuation uh, prepares these micromotors because of the, they have a hydrophobic coating, they can anchor themselves in the stomach wall so that they can improve and prolong the drug delivery. So uh, in our, in our ethics study, we see that this uh, active drug delivery can kill the bacteria six times more effective uh, than conventional treatment without using any proton pump inhibitor. And also we see that uh, there's no uh, side effect of inflammation caused by these micromotors. So this is the first time that we proved that micromotors can be used to effectively treat disease in living animals.
another question uh, was I also mentioned that is that our GI tract the pH is ranging from one to seven. So think about how how would you <coughs> target the intestine if we have micro micromotor made by either zinc or magnesium, actually they will be dissolved in the stomach because we are acidic. So the way I solve this problem is that by coating this micromotor uh, with an enteric coating, meaning that this coating uh, is worse stable in the acidic environment, but it can start to dissolve in the neutral environment. In this case, we can let the micromotors to bypass this very uh, hostile environment in the, in the stomach and precisely targeted the small intestine. Here is the design of these micromotors. So basically they're made by small microtubes and then we load them with magnesium particles. And after uh, we release them, release them, we then coat these micromotors with a, a pH responsive polymer coating. So all of these uh, polymers are actually widely used in the pharmaceutical industry. And then, here we see that we can precisely control the how, when uh, this, this micromotor has been activated. So this is in a neutral environment. After about 20 minutes, this micromotor, micromotor start to be, be activated and the, uh, so that they can penetrate the tissue. So this, another, this video shows how it does work when it enters the GI tract with this enteric coated micromotor. So basically they will not react with gastric environment Rather, they will bypass it, and then when they enter the intestine, they start to dissolve, and magnesium start to be activated. So in this case, uh, we see that we will be able to precisely <clears throat> locate the micromotors in the different segment of the GI tract. So overall, I, I believe that I, I have showed micromotors that can adapt to the local physiological environment. They are able to respond and modulate the local pH to achieve responsive actuation and to enable <clears throat> active and prolonged drug delivery and to improve the therapeutic efficacy. So here uh, is, a sum, is a review paper I wrote uh, three years ago about this area. Actually, they have a lot of other applications in surgery, sensing, detoxification, uh, detoxification and so on. So uh, uh, it's becoming the most cited paper in this sense, robotics. Uh, I'm mentioning this because it really indicates that this is becoming the most emerging, most um, important area in robotics. And I believe that uh, in the future, fantastic, fantastic voyage is not just a dream, but uh, we can really make as a reality. But here's a, probably will not be like this, here, but, but, but be like this. Here's a video I made by my undergrad. Um, as we can see, the, the, the future we are imagining is that um, maybe one day we can use our iPhone or so to control this micro robot for disease treatment. So in that sense, we can really make this healthcare available for everybody and so that we can better deal with this uh, healthcare crisis. So with that, I would like to thank my mentors, uh, Professor Jenan Bao uh, is my is very inspirational leader uh, in software electronics. Uh, Paul Zhao is our work uh, collaborator in the immunosurgeon. And uh, Yu Xin is my major collaborator at Stanford. And Professor Joseph Wang uh, is my PhD mentor, give me a lot of freedom to play different things. And uh, Liang Fang is my uh, co-mentor who expertise in drug delivery and way God did a lot of pioneering work in this field. And uh, thank everyone for listening and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jinxing. It's a very nice talk. So thank you, Jinxing. So it's really excited to hear a lot of uh, fantastic scientific journey from you. And uh, so by hearing our during the talk, so we can tell Jinxing did a lot of work on soft electronics and also micro robots, which certainly can, adapt, can be adaptive to uh, dynamic biological systems as both macro and micro nanoscale systems. So which certainly provides a lot of impact to the biology and medicine. So, so now is the Q&A session and uh, everyone can either pose their questions on the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask Jinxing directly. Uh, I can start with a question. So Jinxing, okay. you have experience with both uh, organic and inorganic, inorganic materials. So you know they are the two major directions as you described. Professor mm -hmm. John Rogers mo most work are, is working on the inorga inorganic materials while Professor Bao is working on organic materials. So mm -hmm. what is your opinion on the two schools of uh, science in this field? 
Okay, that's <laughs> that's a very great question, but also uh, a difficult question. But I think uh, my personal understanding, okay, that's my personal opinion, does not represent my lab's opinion as well. So my, my background is, is uh, ele uh, electrical engineering. So uh, of course, I started with studying like all, this, all of the silicon, which is the uh, inorganic materials. Mm -hmm. So I think till today, I believe that silicon is still the best materials to make computer chips as a semiconductor. Uh, of course, that might change. Like people are starting to, like our lab also work on a lot of CNT materials as well. <clears throat> but I believe for a lot of medical applications, uh, especially uh, under stuff that are gonna to interface with our biolog biologic tissue, I think organic materials will play a very significant role. Uh, for example, like P dot PSS um, is our FDA approved materials for uh, bioelectronics. So, I, and, and also uh, it, the the way it works is more similar to our human body. When we think about the electricity, how electricity is is being um, communicated in our bodies through both electron and ionic conduction, and uh, that's not uh, for for the case of inorganic materials. But in organic materials, we can do that. So I believe. Uh, it depends on what kind of application. And I think in the future, uh, it's more a hybrid approach when we make bioelectronics, but we should merge uh, inorganic materials with organic materials. I see, thank you. Yeah, maybe you can go ahead. I mean, I, mean, I, I just, I just uh, remind you, there are some questions. Uh, you, can, you can go ahead. Uh, you, you are the leader, you are the leader. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so I saw there's some questions in the chat box from audience. So he asked, so hi Jinxing, thanks for the pretty talk. Could you expand a bit more about how did you evaluate the side effect of the micro robots? That's, that's a good question. So what we do is for the DI track, we mainly do the histology to study uh, if there's any inflammation at the stomach tissue or like a intestine tissue. Yeah. Okay, cool. Of course, of course, uh, we, observe, we observe the behavior of mice to see uh, if it's well, it's doing well, like the, the hair and so on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so did you do the like cross section or the uh, like imaging to evaluate? Yeah. 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 Cool. And uh, another question from Jingyi. And uh, so, hi, Jingyi. This is a fantastic talk. I wonder, is there any method to control the trajectory of micro robots. It has was a common method. Uh, yeah, I think I didn't show uh, in this, this presentation, but we, we were trying to uh, control the motion of this. Uh, I can share some of, I can share some of the uh, slides probably. But the control, I think is a very important problem uh, in, this, in this field. Uh, in our, in vivo experiments in the mice, actually we didn't do any control, but we are rather we are doing a random random walk because uh, when it has a accelerated actuation, uh, it can hit the stomach wall. So that, that's what we observed. And of course, we can also do some, uh, do some, for example, uh, antibody modification on this micro robot. So it might be able to target some of the specific cell that's another way to control it. But uh, I'm not able to find the actual slides I want. But anyway, I can explain this. So uh, right now, I think the, the best control method is still to use magnetic field because uh, it really can allow deep tissue penetration. And uh, actually, we have done some work before um, making autonomous navigation, like closed loop navigation of these nano robots, uh, not inside the body. And then that point out another issue uh, is imaging. Uh, I think that's that's an important issue we need to be solved in the coming decade. Is really how we can see this nano object in the biological tissue. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of there are people are really, uh, are starting to working on that using MRI or other technique. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, so <clears throat> some of the other techniques like. I think ultrasound can also be used to propel the micro robots. So is that be can be used to controlling the robots in the human body? 
that's that's a good point. I, I also how and show the any scene related to ultrasound. We also worked on that. Uh, so ultrasound is very interesting. Uh, uh, I have to combine that uh, ultrasound with magnetic field actually to make a hybrid nano 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 robot. Uh, or to control the collective motion of this nano robot. Actually, it's very effective in uh, control group of this, this, this nano robot because acoustic wave always form this nose um, at a specific frequency. Uh, but what we realize is that if we tune the acoustic frequency to make her to really high frequency, actually the nanoparticles, because you can think about the nose is too small, then we can get real random motion actuation of these nano swimmers. Um, but I think that's that's a very promising method, uh, especially using like focused, uh, uh, highly focused intensive ultrasound field that might really be able to uh, make nanorobot penetrate the tissue. And uh, some other work in my lab, uh, some other people done that is make this uh, micro bullet. Probably you you heard about it. It's like to how something could be kind of triggered by ultrasound, and so they can fire and shoot to deep tissue. Yeah, that's another way to, to use our cost beer. Great, cool. Uh, so I saw someone raise his hand, like Jiaming Zhou, and probably Jiaming can, can, you can mute yourself. And you can unmute yourself. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Okay, uh, yeah, so I have a question. So how did you navigate your micro uh, motor inside of the mice body? Uh, when you do the, you did the, the experiment. Yeah, okay, I think that's, that's partially related with the previous control question. So in, in our case, we, how, we didn't do any control uh, because that's per discussion with our collaborator uh, because we are using it to deliver drug and you don't, the original idea, I, I, because I, I'm a big fan of magnetic robot, I, I want to use it to control the motion but our, our collaborator, his point is that um, you don't expect the patient to take the pill and then he had to drive something to control the drug. So he would expect that and just, just take the pill and everything's done, right? So in this case, uh, it is a random work. There's no control at all. It's just because we are coating this micro robot with a polymer, uh, which has a strong adhesion to the stomach wall so that to let it stay longer time in the GI tract. But I believe, as I mentioned before, uh, we could use a lot of method, mm -hmm. uh, particularly using magnetic method to control them uh, in biology environment. Okay, so if you are uh, trying to use a magnetic control, and uh, how will this um, micro robot react to the uh, body's environment and also uh, uh, the side effect since you are adding, uh, you're adding other components inside? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the side effect. So there are two ways I, I will answer your question. The first is what materials we've been using uh, in our case uh, is that we are using the micro motors, uh, first zinc magnesium. I think a lot of people have been used for uh, biodegradable electronics. Um, and other than that is the uh, polymer, uh, degradable polymer we are using and also the drug. So there's no side effect from the materials we are using. And then this is one thing. Another thing is that you mentioned probably if this microbe goes to the tissue, um, I think all, it's all about the size. If you are making something extremely small, as small as a single cell, when they travel through the tissue, I don't think they will induce any inflammation. And that's the biggest advantage. Uh, we should develop this area to make micro nanorobots because uh, they're, they're not going to induce any side effect, I think. Okay. And then think about the like, uh, yeah, think, uh, uh, just add one more thing. Think about people using micro needle for drug delivery. The needle actually tens of micro, but it's, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's another question. You're talking about uh, uh, the neural implementation on the mice. And then uh, uh, did you ever study uh, the removal of uh, your component from, uh, from the neuron? Uh, you mean the first work, right? Yeah, the first work. Uh, so like so, uh, in case yeah, of yeah. the component breakdown or whatever reason, okay, okay. Uh, the patient want to get it removed, like okay, how okay. be the process? So that's a good question. Uh, I can show you these, but I, but I think uh, uh, that can be removed. 
the 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 implant can be can be easily re removed. I think I let me let me show you these slides. You can see the slides. Yeah. So we we really try to remove the device. As you can see, for our soft electronics, uh, the polymer actually we can easily peel it off because it's made by uh, viscoplastic materials. But a single part of the coffee electrode actually is very is, is impossible to remove it. Basically, uh, there are a lot of uh, they grow together and there are a lot of compression, so it's, it's not, not possible. So that's sort of an advantage for our polymer electronics that uh, even we didn't emphasize this point, but uh, it's much easier to be removed than conventional coffee electrode. But I think <clears throat> your point is good, but I think uh, more important is to keep it stable rather than remove it because still many of these patients, they need long-term kind of treatment. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think another form of uh, electronics should be called transient electronics, which can be uh, degradable and uh, yeah. after yeah. several weeks. Uh, but I think that, that the problem with that the transient electronics is that we cannot control the degrading process in the, in the tissue, right? So yeah, it, yeah, it yeah. just degrade uh, as the time goes. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree with that. I think, uh, I think for bioelectronics, uh, keep it stable is most important rather than degrade. So hopefully, when you are dead, your device still alive. I think. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I saw some other question from Jingyi. So, so she asked, "Have you ever worked on ma magnetic micro robots?" So I think I think you have done a lot of work, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So it show, as you showed slide. So another question from Jingjie Hu. So hi Jingjie, thanks for the great talk. Just wondering if you have tried to attach peptide or other molecular recognition unit on the surface of the nano robots to target treatment. So this is a like protein engineering question. It's pretty interesting. Okay, I think I think that's a very very uh, wonderful question because um, in, in my PhD lab we we have been working on that to modify the surface. Uh, for example, what we have done uh, is is uh, <clears throat> certain antibody to recognize the CTC cell, uh, that's, that's doable. But I think in the future, uh, when we really make this inside our body, that's, that's one thing we need, is either modify the surface or directly use peptide to make this nano robot. I think that's the uh, right direction to go. I think and there are a lot of possibilities. Yeah, I, I didn't work on that, but uh, I think that's, that's the uh, right direction to go. Yeah, so another question from Yin Yin. So can those micro robots, the base chemical detection sensor be made reusable? Reusable, you mean, oh, okay, the sensor, right? The sensor is quite, uh, so one example I showed this, uh, the sensor is like hydrazine, right? I, I believe that is definitely reusable. When there is hydrazine coming, then these nano robots can always be activated. There is, uh, because it's through a, Catalytic reaction, yeah. Mm -hmm. This this micro nano robot, the surface they, they decompose the hydrazine, and and so that they can they can they can swim around. Yeah. Cool. So another question yeah. from Wang mm -hmm. Chen. So hi Jinjin, thanks for the great talk. Would it be possible to load your micro robots on swimming bacteria for drug delivery? Load, load, load this. Uh, load on the the. The swimming bacteria. So if you want to in incorporate with uh, bacteria. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, yeah. I um, I didn't do bacteria, but that's 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 in the field. The people have work, have been working on that. So uh, there are a lot of people making they call a hybrid nanomotor. Uh, they made some like microstructures and they use like bacteria, uh, either their motion or their swarm control the motion of this micro micro machine. I think that's that's uh, one thing. And another interesting uh, work uh, people have done is Oliver Schmidt's group. Uh, our, our lab also work on that, uh, to use sperm cells. Uh, so basically uh, what they have done is that they, they kind of assemble the sperm cell with a micro tube, which is magnetic. In this case, they can control the sperm cell motion uh, 
so that it can work as hybrid motors. So they aim to use this for fertilization. I think uh, that's, that's also one uh, application uh, very interesting. But, uh, but of course, I think uh, uh, on the other, I think that probably his or her questions about uh, uh, bacteria, can we load bacteria to deliver bacteria? I think that's also doable, uh, also depends on um, if you make structures that can, you can uh, grow this bacteria on this micro robot so that we can um, use this for like a uh, biotherapy. I think that's also doable. And also going back to uh, Ying Ying's point, I think, uh, uh, I think she's working on the environment related. Uh, actually, there are, there are a lot of things that Howen mentioned that we uh, use a lot of using this nanorobot to clean the like, uh, water to uh, destroy the chemical and biological weapon. So that's actually made in my major funding source uh, from the DOD uh, Defense Reduction Agency. Uh, we try to use this nanorobot uh, to rapidly destroy, uh, destroy all the biological warfare agents like bacteria. Very nice. So another question from Mi Xiaocheng. So hi, Jingjing, this is a very interesting talk. Thank you for sharing. I have a question regarding the chemical reaction and the exhaust of the chemical propel micro robots. So do the exhausted product undergo any subsequent reaction? So is the react reaction exothermic or endothermic? So is there any potential side effect due to the nature of those reactions? Yeah, that's, I, I think it also, it's all about when you talk about uh, side effect or toxicity, I think uh, uh, is always related with uh, how much you use. Like, uh, so even water can be toxic if you drink too much. So it do have side effect if you overdose the micro motors in the mouse. And we did see that uh, before uh, when we didn't have a good design, when we had to use a lot of uh, this micro robot to deliver drug uh, at the beginning. We, we try to use this micro uh, rocket at the beginning, but we realized that the rocket actually can load less than the sphere particles. So that's why we changed our design. And, uh, and uh, in, my, in our first trial, we, we did see the, uh, there are a lot of damage to the mice because probably there are a lot of bubbles being generated. So with optimized design and minimum generation of this oxygen or, or hydrogen uh, in, the, in the stomach, I think, uh, uh, that can be reduced. Cool. Uh, so another question from Zhang Shuilou. So, hey, Jinxing, thanks for great talk. How to defabricate your biosensors? So can I be easily be mass fabricated? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's a question. Uh, we, the very great point when we develop bioelectronics tool or neural engineering tools, uh, if we really want to make them useful, I think fabrication is very important because there's no established technique for us to, to, to fabricate this bioelectronic device. So the, for the morphine electronics, uh, I'm using a very simple method, like a laser cutter, everybody can use it. But I think uh, for neural stimulation, that's fairly good enough. It has a resolution of about 200 micron. And uh, we just, so, so basically what I do is I just, for the P.PSS I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. I just been coating a layer and I use the laser cutter to remove the area I don't, do not want, then it form an electrode. And then I use the polymer to transfer it. Uh, so the, I would say the whole process is very uh, scalable and robust. So uh, I think, I think uh, for, this is like for neural, neural stimulation, but for recording probably you might need the photolithography uh, in our lab, like. Uh, people try to develop like a, a nanofabrication method to process this soft materials well. Cool, so the stimulator usually size is relatively bigger than the sensor itself, right? So like 10 yeah, times. Yeah, the stimulation, uh, but that's another point. Ideally, we should have better target of neural stimulation, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can precisely, for example, for mm -hmm. spinal cord stimulation, if you can target a single neuron probably you can get a much precise control of your motion and so on. So I think that, or like how much precise disease treatment. Right now, a lot of these neural stimulators, they just randomly kind of, uh, they have a few, they are, they are modulating the pattern, the waveform, rather than control which, which nerve you, you modulate. So 
that's that's people are working on. Yeah. Yeah, very much echo your point. Mm -hmm. So so there's a lot of other questions like uh, from Zhang Shiming. So so nice talk, thanks Jinxing. Could you tell the source that P dot PSS was approved by FDA? Hey Jinxing, you mute yourself. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's, it, it has already been used in human study. Yeah. Hey, so Jinxing, thanks for the talk. Uh, no, this is my question. Yeah. Uh -huh. I just want yep. to know the talk, source that you mentioned that PWPSS has already been approved by F FDA for. Yeah, I think, I, I think so. I think so. Uh, so if you look at the either Edward Chang from UCSF as well as uh, Shadi Dyer's uh, paper on UC San Diego, all of this, uh, when they do this ECOG recording, all of these materials that twice are coded with P.PSS and they directly used for um, human patient. So you're sure that the material P.PSS is approved by FDA? I think so, yeah. Okay. And another follow-up question on, on this one is that you mentioned actually you transfer the P.PSS from the other uh, substrates and then to the PDMS you, you, you fabricated, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So it's a yep. transfer printing process. Okay. And yes, how so do you, how do you improve the adhesion of this PWPSS in film on the? <laughs> yeah, substrate? that's that's the point. I haven't really uh, spoken about. Uh, so so uh, is enabled by the both the self healing capacity and the viscosity of, of the PWPSS. We have this glycerol mixed with PWPSS. It's not a <laughs> Like pure PSS, and uh, we did take a, like a look at the interface um, of the of the PSS and the PDMS uh, using SEM. Uh, what we see is that we form very very good interface. Um, there's there's no uh, kind of denomination on that. So yeah, we did check that. So how about the thickness of the PSS? I think it's about uh, from ranging from fifty. T to about 100 micro, yeah. Oh, so it's pretty sick. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty sick. Um, yeah, it's, it's because uh, it's much easier to handle if you make it sick. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So I have a question regarding the morphine electronics. So I saw the paper that you published. Uh, we are doing the experiment on muscular tissue. So have you guys tried on uh, implant those uh, morphine electronics to? the brain tissue in the infant or neonatal mice? You, you mean muscular tissue, right? Uh, or uh, brain so tissue. Have, you, have you done this kind of experiment in the brain okay, tissue? Okay. Our original thought is to make a brain stimulator for mm -hmm. children. <laughs> so, and then we switched to an easier way to demo our device um, because I think the, the brain, the surgery and everything is more complicated so but i think that's that's something uh we will try to explore yeah and also yeah. Uh, we did muscle stimulation as well i'm not sure you, yeah you 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 mentioned the muscular mus uh, tissue i think we we did also we did that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so i have the same experience when i do so when i do the implantation of the, to some new natal mice they are very easy to to die in in a, in a few days so when they when they grow when they are mature, so after we do the implantation, they can probably survive. But uh, when they are in a baby stage, so implantation will cause a lot of damage, even though all the meshes are like nanoscale or entirely mm -hmm. soft. Yeah, I think uh, also it because of the dimension, probably uh, the implantation you use for for smaller. Uh, in our case, we use rat. Um, we also sort of oh. use mice. Uh, it's just yeah, yeah. I think the surgical process is more much more complicated. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And probably rat is more stronger than, than mice. Yeah. Rat, rat is very. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in Europe. Mm -hmm. So, so there are a question from Krishna and Hi Jinjin is very insightful talk. Can you uh, throw some light on the future and feasibility of harvesting energy for proportion of micro robots? So when you, I think uh, harvesting energy, I, uh, so briefly speaking, uh, there are like a lot of energy resource uh, 
we can use like a one thing I show is the like chemical proportion. Uh, that's that's one way, and magnetic <coughs> magnetic actuation and also acoustic actuation uh, I just mentioned, <coughs> and uh, of course light. Uh, I think there a recent paper published on Nature uh, using similar method which I uh, used for like this rolled up micro rockets. I think they just they, they roll up two micro rockets or four micro rockets on the other leg. Uh, so they use light to control the motion. I think that's also uh, one way to 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 other energy harvesting method. Um, of course, if we can how like uh, RF or wireless uh, energy harvesting, that would be good because that in that sense we might be able to have better control. But right now, if, if we think about, as I'm still more obsessed with magnetic actuation because uh, it's just, first of all, it's, it's much more like tissue that has, like basically tissue is transparent in magnetic field uh, in terms of penetration. And also it's very compatible with imaging device like MRI and other technology. But I think uh, that's, uh, also uh, I think for the implantable device, people have been using ultrasound for charging uh, like neural stimulation device, I think probably that's uh, that's also uh, feasible, and uh, but but also it also depends on size. If we really want to make a uh, device on micro nanoscale, I think it's still very difficult uh, to to like how to to store energy if you use your battery. We still rely on the uh, like this uh, environment and uh, remote actuation. Yeah. Yeah, great. So I think uh, we can still take another uh, question from one audience so because the time is limited. So from Bo Guangyuan. So hi, Ji Jun, thank you for your great talk. I have a follow up question regarding the stability of Morphe. So I assume the electro has to be connected to some uh, external devices. So if so, it, it does the viscoplasticity of the Morphe electronics affect its stability outside the body. So, oh, so this is the first question. So we can discuss based on, based on that. Yeah, another question. So you mean the stability outside the body? Oh, so I, I think he probably saying the internal devices will have a mechanical mismatch with the external electronic recording devices. So he, 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 is, uh, he is thinking about if there is a this mismatch will cause any instability of the entire system. So you mean the interconnect? Uh, yeah, yeah, the interconnect, okay. the internal soft device interconnect, and also the external rigid uh, devices. Okay, that's that's a, that's a very good point. That's also the point the reviewer asked us <laughs> in in the paper. So, uh, in in the current case, uh, we were, what we are doing is that uh, uh, we have we do have like a wire to connect this Morphe, and. Uh, for like a few months, it is stable. But ideally, uh, we should have uh, wireless stimulation, I think. And uh, for in that, sense, in that case, uh, I think the RF receiver uh, could be made by like a soft, like for example, silver or something like that. And uh, in this case, uh, we, we are particularly focused on the part which interface with the neuron that should grow with the neuron. So that's that's our major focus. But if in the future, I think we, we should have it uh, integrated with another soft R RF receiver, so that we do not need any uh, handling of this 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 device, and it can like wirelessly re record uh, receive the signal stimulation. Great. I think this is uh, our last question. So well, we also have another concern. So I was wondering what's the interface between the micro robots and the cell? So the interaction seems very stable. So is it a purely physical interaction? Sorry, can you repeat the interaction? So he was wondering what's the interface between the micro robot and the cell? So what's the interaction? Oh, interaction. interaction. <clears throat> I think probably She's asking about the video I shown in the transport of the cell, right? So, yeah, yeah, in case, yeah, yeah, yeah. In that case, uh, the interaction is very interesting 
when you are actuating this micro swimmer, mi micro robot with either an oscillating or rotational magnetic field, so this, there will be a small white micro vortex generated surrounding by this micro swimmer. So that vortex can capture the cell. There's no specific charge or like a bonding or like chemical bonding there. It is simple because when you're moving, you're generating vortex and you, that vortex captures the cell. So when you stop this actuation, they are separate actually. But when you actuate it, you start to capture the cell again. So that's, that's something uh, very interesting. Uh, probably people in your acoustic field also did a lot of that. Uh, if there's like a micro node or, or local, local stream, it can capture, capture the cell. Cool. So I think our Q and A session came to an end, and probably Bing Bing and Xiao can do a conclusion of the talk today. Xiao, yeah, thank you, uh, Jinxing, for the very nice talk, and thank you everyone for the participation. It's been a great activity, and I guess we'll see you next time for the TMS talk. Yeah, thank you everybody, and thank you Jinxing for your fantastic talk. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you everyone for coming to my talk. Yeah, yeah, we and, and just just the, the the just the ad we have a WBA talk tomorrow morning, right? Jen? Yeah, uh, yes. Just broadcast our next activities. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can check our website for the information like on the tomorrow's yeah. talk. Cool. Yeah. Great. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Jing. Hi, Jing. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, we, we, I think next time I can put like on the slides that, okay, like uh, we still have 10 minutes or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It might be better. So otherwise, like uh, new people might be confused. Like uh, what's the time to begin the talk? Already see a lot of people joined. Uh, yeah, and usually like the peak time will be you know just right on eleven to eleven five. It will be yeah. peak time. Like, mm -hmm. everyone yeah. Will be joining. yeah, that's what happened in our group meeting. I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, but your group is very large, right? How many people is in the professor job, uh, boss group right now? Probably like uh, 60 to 70 people, I guess. 60? <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> uh, like like uh, PhD student, probably 15 and postdoc. Right now, I think about 15 as well. But we, we also have a lot of visiting and uh, undergrads, master students working in the lab. Uh, okay, I see. So, so I guess you, how often you can meet with Professor Paul? Like, uh, we're we're often. I just met him her yesterday. So uh, we uh, we have like, uh, she's she's very available. Oh, uh, I see. So we have like a <clears throat> bi-weekly group meeting. Mm -hmm. But I'm in two subgroups, so I'm the only one in two subgroups in the lab. So I, I, I um, kind of um, have like uh, every, every week I have like subgroup and mm -hmm. we have a big group meeting on Monday morning. Okay. Then uh, that one is only uh, three people present. Yeah. But in the subgroup, everybody need to report. Um. But right now, only one people present in big group meeting because uh, we're not working that much in the past few months, I think. Um, yeah. So, so, is how, how, mm -hmm. so, I mean, is a is fire in California okay? <laughs> I think it's not so good today. Uh, the air quality is not very good. It's very bad. I think the PM 2.5 is uh, uh, approaching 200 right now. I just checked. So yeah, it's still, I, I, yeah, I, I found I found the news just report the fire will uh, across the border of Canada. And, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. 
it's very it's very close to Vancouver or Vancouver I think it's Vancouver yeah okay so just across the rocky rocky mountain and go to going to Canada I see but you, you should be safe I think <laughs> yeah we are in the east <laughs> yeah so what, what is the uh, COVID uh, situation so like are, are you guys back to work Jen uh, me for me like uh well, right now I'm just waiting for my, you know, the, my work officially started. So I'm just like in a gap right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. okay, that's good. For me, for me, our lab is in Albany, and uh, we can we can go to go to go to the lab for experiment. But I currently I I I prefer not cause cause the case the new case increase every day. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the situation is not good actually. It's, mm -hmm. And now it's full season, so. I think our lab um, uh, is like, uh, we are doing a rotation, but I think uh, uh, whenever you, you want to come, you can find a spot. So I think uh, some of the people I feel like are working full time, yeah. Okay, so the space is very, it's very like spacious for can accommodate everybody. Yeah, yeah, I think in my lab it is that case. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have now from. Yeah, Chonghe is here as well. Yeah, Chonghe. <laughs> uh, I think he muted. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Chongho, can you like record like on your uh, computer as well? Like, uh, oh yeah, yeah, sure. sure. But, uh, yeah, thank you. Oh, so I need a permission to. Do you need a permission to do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Wait, like. Yeah. Let Let me check. Like I saw, like it's automatic. Like, People can record as well, uh, but I guess it's not. Okay. So let others record. So then, so our our talk will begin exactly at eleven ten, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, usually you can start to introduce, like, uh, you know, start the pre-talk sessions mm -hmm. like five minutes, right. before, five minutes or, okay. like, three, five minutes before, and uh, then... Okay, okay. Yeah, so, I, I would begin my opening at 11.05, okay? 11.05, I think it's, uh, it's, it's all right, yeah. Okay. It's okay. all right, yeah. Yeah. Let me check if I can give a new document. Oh, allow record. Yeah, now I think Chonghe and uh, Xiao, you can now record. I gave you the yeah, 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 I saw, I saw Shuai Rong. Hey, Shuai Rong, Shuai Rong. Hey. Want to say hi to everybody? <laughs> everybody? Yeah. Yeah, Shuai, Shuai Rong is my friend and uh, currently a postdoc. Uh, at University of Toronto with Professor Alan Willer. Yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah oh, nice I, also, to meet you. I also see some friends there. Yeah, yeah me too. As well as my lab member. <laughs> That's good. So we are starting at 11.05 or? 11 uh, 5. 11 5. Yeah, 11.05, like uh, Bingbing will give the uh, mm -hmm. okay. yeah. introduction. Yeah. 
Oh, Jinxin, you worked with uh, Professor Joseph Wong in the past, right? Yeah, that's true. Uh, my PhD, yeah. Yes, because he visited uh, our lab last year, uh, so I showed him around. And also, I think uh, Professor Vigo also uh, visited our li li lab last year, so I showed him around. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you work with them, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joe is very energetic, right? <laughs> He's uh, always like very passionate, I think. Talk about uh, about his work on the on on, on the sensors here mm -hmm. last year, and uh, and he's interested in the microfluidics technology that uh, they are working on. So um, I showed him around. Yeah, he's very energetic and very active. Yeah. <clears throat> So what do you use the microfluidics for? Like why, what are you working on? Uh, we are working on using microfluidics for uh, point of care diagnostics. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, for kind of like disease diagnostic, clinical applications like that. Great. So now it's 11.5. Jen, can I just open today's talk? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I will okay. just, uh, you know, I will disappear <laughs> okay. for a while. Yeah. Okay, so 